Welcome to Conversations on the Future of Democracy, a series sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. I am John Haskell, Director of the Kluge Center. Today I'm joined by Constanza Stelzenmuller, the Senior Fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institute. She was recently the Kissinger Chair on Foreign Policy and International Relations at the Kluge Center. Also, Andrew Weiss is with us. He is James Family Chair and Vice President of Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he oversees research both in Washington and Moscow on Russia and Eurasia. We're happy to announce that Andrew will be coming to the Kluge Center this fall as the Library of Congress Chair in US-Russia Relations. Welcome to you both. Great to Thank be you. Here. Thanks for having us. Well, we're in a real serious time right now, of course, for all kinds of reasons. And uh, the topic of our conversation, uh, creative or destructive force, COVID-19, Russia and the European democracies is a part of a much larger picture. But let's just uh, go right into it, Constanza, about what's going on in the EU now. Uh, what's your assessment of leadership provided by Germany and France in the face of the pandemic? Okay, so there's a variety of levels that we ought to look at here. I am German myself, so I can speak to the German experience, but Germany doesn't represent the entirety of the EU, and in fact, its behavior is often quite controversial. Currently, we seem to be in a sort of exception mode from that, but that's likely to be short-lived. So to explain, um, health provision pandemics in general is not an EU competence, very much resides in the hands of the nation states. And so what you've seen over the first two and a half, three months of the pandemic is a broad variety of different approaches. Most of them characterized, unlike say in Asia, um, by you know, a certain slowness to respond and then a scramble to test um, and finally to shut things down. And then in a second round um, to mitigate the immense economic damage uh, projected from the basically national shutdowns all across Europe and border closures, which we haven't seen since you know the 1970s. I mean, I last saw European borders when I was a child. Um, specifically, I think it's also important to note that while Germany has been getting an awful lot of praise for the way it managed things, I think part of that was luck. Uh, and I, there may be one or two points that were, you know, genuine, I think, genuinely deserving of praise. So let me start with the luck. I think we were lucky that our medical system was relatively top heavy in ICU beds, uh, in intensive care unit beds. That was very helpful. Um, we also had the capacity to do extensive testing. Um, but there was, because we have a very federal culture, there was an awful lot of bickering and sort of mutual, you know, racing and political campaigning, thinly veiled uh, between the candidates who want to succeed Angela Merkel as, as chancellor for about two or three weeks and precious time was lost. I think our death rate and our infection rate would have been much smaller had we not lost that time. And I think finally the chancellor sort of and her government pulled the 16 state governors, the minister presidents together and said, you know, this is, just not a good look and we need to have a coordinated position. Now that we're reopening again, that sort of march in lockstep, which looked so good from the outside is unraveling a bit. I think two points, I, I would actually praise her on that leadership. It was very rational, very empathic, um, empathetic, and, and I think very well organized. She's one of the least narcissistic and needy leaders in Europe. And, and I think that really mattered at that point. Um, and the other thing, point in which, of course, we are incredibly lucky is that we had this historic budget surplus before the crisis began. So despite the fact that we're looking at GDP drops of 7% or more, we're in a position to throw what the finance minister Schultz called the big bazooka at this stuff. And not just that, we were in a position to offer um, Europe a very large half trillion euro recovery package together with the French. Perhaps one final point. Uh, the Germans have been uh, demonstrating in the streets in recent week uh, weekends, uh, complaining about the harshness of the lockdown. And frankly, our lockdown was a lot less harsh than what the poor Spanish, the Italians and the French had to endure. 
who literally were not allowed to leave their houses, not even with the kids, whereas the Germans cheerfully went jogging. So frankly, you know, I think a little less smugness and a bit of recognition of just how good we had it would be quite nice. Thank you very much. Constanza, why don't you speak a little bit more to the to the recovery fund? I, I know uh, sure. that's getting a lot of attention and uh, perhaps for good reason. Uh, what are its prospects and uh, what difference is it going to make? Okay, so um, the recovery fund, as I already said, is an offer um, from France and Germany to mm -hmm. essentially combine with the currently being negotiated EU budget, which is a multi-annual financial framework, mm -hmm to throw in an additional, an additional half trillion dollars. And I'm amazed at myself at the ease with which I say things like half trillion. Uh, that's not something I could do in my private life, but here we are. And um, that is something that is perhaps not quite as surprising from the French, but for the Germans and particularly for Angela Merkel and her coalition government of conservatives and social Democrats, center left, center right, is a real sort of you know, Copernican moment. Uh, Copernican moment in the sense that, that this is a moment where the Germans said, okay, Europe doesn't revolve around Germany. Actually, Germany revolves all around Europe. We are existentially bound to the European project and our neighbors. And this means in the situation of crisis where it's nobody's fault and it's an exogenous shock, we need to help to the degree that we are able and we are very much able and we will do this with grants rather than loans. That's the German position and that's a huge shift for this particular generation, particularly of the German conservative politicians. It's amazing. Um, now the opposition to that within the EU is headed by what has been termed the frugal four, Austria, Denmark, the Netherlands and Sweden who take objection to the fact that these are supposed to be grants rather than loans and are saying, you know, this is just rewarding those lackadaisical Southerners for lax, you know, behavior, a lack of saving and whatnot. And frankly, I mean, that is about the thinnest possible argument that you could come up with in this situation. And so that position has been treated with a fair amount of, shall we say, disdain by, and not just by French and Germans. Um, I really don't see that going very far. The one point that, that they have, uh, but I think it's one that can also be eliminated, the, the point that they have is that they're saying, wait a moment, is this a, another Hamiltonian moment where, we're, where this is like the first step to another step of massive European integration? And my answer to that is, you know what, that can only happen with a treaty change and that means European unanimity and so the four have a veto in that. Right now this is a one-off, the people who are propagating are saying this is a one-off so frankly you know I would not stare this gift horse in the mouth too long because you know it could gallop away or just you know die in the pandemic. So it, it, even this, uh, forget about a, a change in the treaty, even this requires unanimity right? Yeah exactly. And so, so you think you think that's likely to happen? I think it's very likely to happen. I mean, it's possible that the outcome will be a bit of a fudge, you know, just so the frugal four and possible other opponents who are hiding behind them, although I'm not really seeing any at this point, um, you know, can say, oh, well, you know, we sort of, you know, we got we got something out of this. But I think the bo if the bottom line is, you know, every country in Europe getting additional stimulus money, um, I think my response is kind of what's not to like. Also, uh, look at the joblessness rates. Look at the projections for GDP. Look at what's happening to great power competition all around Europe with Russia, China, and America. Are we in a position to, as they say in your culture, to putz around um, on, on stuff like this? I don't think so. I think this is the moment when we stand up and put up and, and save the project. Mm -hmm. So let's turn to Russia for a second. We'll get back to uh, Europe. But Andrew, kind of the same question regarding Russia is how is Putin handling the pandemic? Uh, you're, you know, famous for being knowledgeable about what's really going on internally in Russian politics. Uh, what you read, what ordinary people like me read is that it's not going very well for him. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, John, I'm really delighted to be joining the Kluge Center. So that, you know, we're excited. Exciting uh, honor. Absolutely. 
really thrilled. Um, you should be. <laughs> there's a tendency to make really sweeping judgments about Russia, and it's not, in this case, you know, really helpful to say Putin is on the ropes or Putin, like dictators the world over, loves COVID and, you know, he's seizing the opportunity to entrench himself and expand his powers. Putin has sweeping czar-like authority today. So what will be different is that he will, on July 1, go to a sort of plebiscite on extending his power and time in office, potentially till, till 2036. So basically subverting term limits and staying in power like a sultan. Um, he didn't really need COVID to do that. Um, it clearly forced his hand and made, maybe made him show his true colors after uh, talking about other possible ways to transition potentially. But the reality is there is no transition for Vladimir Putin. There's no easy way for him to be the center of the system, the fulcrum of the system, and groom a su successor, because he would then sort of overnight turn into a lame duck. As far as COVID goes, Russia for a brief period felt, you know, that they were going to be able to dodge this bullet and that the pandemic would not hit Russia with the same severity. So there was some schadenfreude and I think a lot of just bad policymaking. So we've seen repeatedly in the Putin era the Russian government being late, being passive, and being just kind of un, sort of unaware of the forces of globalization and how they would affect Russia's vaunted stability. So what's different for them, and this is why I caution against any sort of rush to say Putin's going to suffer a big blow from all this, is some striking differences. Putin has actually been very hands-off during this crisis. And so I know in Western societies and in individual states, the United States or at the federal level, everyone's sort of always looking for someone to show leadership and to really, you know, coordinate in a big country, the disaster response. In this case, Putin has kind of said, I'm too big for this COVID thing and basically tried to play past the parcel and pass responsibility for what is going to be a big unpleasant mess to others, either at the regional level or inside the Russian government. Um, that is not unique to Russia. There are authoritarian leaders in the Middle East who've done exactly that, who see the outfall of the, out, um, the fallout from COVID as a loser to them. Um, frankly, it's not that different from what's happened in the United States as well, where we see a blame shifting exercise underway. So as far as Russia's own problems, those are piling up and none of what's happened makes those problems any easier for Putin to manage if and when the pandemic passes. He still has an economy which is largely stagnant, but he has chosen basically to bring up the defenses, to stockpile hard currency, to basically fortify the, the, the ramparts around his regime instead of having a decentralized, more free Russia. He has made a decision in the wake of the war in Ukraine and all of the economic sanctions and hardship that has befallen Russia as a result of that horrible action in Ukraine. So he's chosen to make Russia less dynamic and less economically vibrant. But at, you know, to, to put this in perspective, he now has half a trillion dollars worth of hard currency reserves to basically keep himself safe. He doesn't have any external foreign debt to speak of. So he's basically created a fortress Russia. Whether or not those defenses start to be significantly degraded by the crisis is unclear. Oil prices, for example, are significantly lower than they were at the beginning of the crisis but they've recovered somewhat. So for a Russia which you know, is highly dependent on the price of oil, they can get by on basically sequestering, on tightening their belts, basically pushing the pain of this adjustment onto average people. It's not like the Russian people had a great public health system before COVID, they didn't. And part of the reason they don't is because the Russian government has deliberately unfunded it and stockpiled a lot of those oil windfalls in a rainy day fund. So these are the result of conscious choices. And it is, you know, you know, so far, we've seen 20 years of Mr. Putin. It's a very, uh, you know, I'd say it's a mugs game to sort of bet on any particular issue as being the thing that tips this whole uh, Putin system over. It's a rickety system. There are exogenous shocks that might do that. But in some ways, people are pinning their hopes on this particular crisis
and saying maybe this will be the thing that, you know, either forces the Russian people to rise up or create so much socioeconomic distress that the system starts to break down. So, uh, I mean, a lot of commentators do say that that uh, that Putin's handling of the of the pandemic puts the regime as it is today at risk. Uh, and that does make sense. Uh, there's a there's a brain drain in Russia. And uh, as you said, the economy is not very good and really hasn't been for a long time. Could be could this be the thing that puts it over the edge? You're suggesting maybe not. Right. Well, you know, I don't I'm not in the business of making predictions because I think, you know, that's something where there's just, you know, it's just you know easy to do a lot of self harm. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, we have you know, in most average Russians' minds, very vivid memories of the 1990s when Russia went through something on the order of the U.S. Great Depression or something markedly worse, where people didn't have enough food to eat. And so there's a general construct in most people's minds that the regime also amplifies whenever it can, which is you don't want to go back to that, do you? And so that sort of creates an argument in favor of continuity and stability with the existing system. The other thing that provides for a level of continuity is there are no alternatives. There is no competitive political system and there's nothing else that's on offer. There's no charismatic counter to Putin that average people can look to and say, or more importantly, frankly, the Russian elite can look to and say, that's someone we can rally around who would be better than Putin. There's, there's no agreement about what that alternative future might be. So in the end, inertia and resilience in the system carry a lot of potency. The final thing is the repressive capacity of the Russian state is very much not being taxed. And so it's hard to you know, sort of say this because I'm not you know, wanting to point out some of the things that the regime has going for it, but there are a lot of repressive capacities and abilities to do harm, to deter people from taking situation into their own hands. And so the average Russian sees what's done on a demonstration basis where a single student gets plucked out for something they posted online on Facebook. And a lot of people get the message and people retreat from political speech. People see what happens to demonstrators. They see how the regime means business and they retreat. So there's a lot going on inside the system itself that, you know, again, argues in the direction of conformism, risk aversion, and basically trying to find compromise with the Putin system and basically retreat from taking a more frontal, uh, confrontational approach. So Constanza, one of the things uh, Andrew said, uh, he talked about governments and whether it's the Middle East or, or in, in the case of Putin, not handling you know, autocracies, essentially not handling the pandemic very well. Um, and uh, the UK and Italy arguably aren't handling it very well in Europe and your area of expertise so what's the key? I mean, I mean you know, it, it, what's what's the, the the secret sauce for for dealing with uh, you know a massive crisis like this? So I think there. Are, I think you have to sort of try to divide this out analytically into weaknesses and strengths. Um, and the weaknesses you might group under the header of pre-existing conditions. And some of those pre-existing conditions are more obvious than others. Say, take the case of Italy, very good medical system, but a demographic, particularly in the areas skewed hardest by, uh, hit hardest by the, by the pandemic, skewed very much towards a 60, 70 plus older demographic, um, which turned out to be exquisitely vulnerable um, to when the pandemic struck. Um, I think another pre-existing condition is population density um, and living conditions in general. That was something that played a big role in New York. Um, unequal access to healthcare, yeah, that ma matters like hell. The two factors um, that appear to precondition success are, I think, and this is, I'm, I'm quoting Frank Fukuyama here, who wrote this in a recent piece, are government capability and citizen trust. And the thing is that you can find those two qualities on the whole spectrum from very liberal democracy to autocracy, although it's notable that the, the biggest autocracies, uh, Russia, China, and Brazil, haven't had a great pandemic. 
And the, I would say, if you will forgive me my saying this, the populist run United States government also hasn't been doing a great job um, with a president who says he has all authority but leaves all responsibility to the states and to the governors. Um, that uh, I think has made, at least for some very mixed messaging and a great deal of confusion uh, in a situation where it would be helpful uh, or would have been helpful, probably still is helpful, to coordinate more between the federal and the state level. Um, but again, I mean, I'm the first to say that we've, we're seeing this kind of confusion between the states and competition between the states and their leaders in Germany right now as well. The tr um, but then you have a relatively authoritarian state like Singapore that also has done very well. Or a democracy like Japan, where with a very high level of citizen deference and trust, that also has done well and and literally and 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 managed the pandemic with far fewer of the restrictions uh, than were imposed in Europe, including on Germany. Um, so those are the the, the two points. I, I think the you know coming away from your your point about the autocrats, I think for us Western democracies, it's important to say that in some ways this pandemic has shown up structural weaknesses in Western democracies in ways that were perhaps not quite as clear before or that we have not wanted to see. It's held up a mirror to the deficiencies, the structural deficiencies, the inequities, the inequalities, the unfairnesses of our own systems. And I think, you know, if there is a silver lining to this, I think that is, it is literally that it forces us to examine this and to come to term to, to term with it. Um, because these are vulnerabilities that will not just, if, if remained untreated, will expose us to the next sort of exogenous shock and also expose us to external pressure by autocrats. So it's in our own interest to, to get a grip on this. Can I just tag on to yeah, something sure. related to what Chris was saying, which is, in the case of Russia, what's remarkable is the gap between the particularly Western perception of how the state's authority and authoritarian nature impact average people's lives and the reality. So what we've seen in Russia for all the sort of focus in 20 years of Putin's tenure on the state and reestablishing a strong state is the state didn't deliver for the average person in Russia, it didn't deliver mm -hmm. that health care. Mm -hmm. And then when the state was trying to enforce the quarantine lockdown provisions, it didn't do that very well either. It basically, you know, the Russians looked at what China had done with tremendous envy and they saw the way China automates digital control of the population, mm -hmm. how it uses facial recognition and other technologies for societal control. And it tried to do something as basic as rolling out an app that everybody in some major yeah. city would have to carry around that would give you a green or red stamp that would allow you to move around. And they couldn't even do that right. So there was a level of you know exposing here the ineptitude and the deficiencies of Russia's authoritarian system mm. and more kind of seeing the state disappear in a crisis. So the average person in some ways has felt more exposed, more vulnerable, and has retreated as a result because they see that they basically are on their own. And the social guarantees and the other things that the Soviet Union at right. least provided no longer are there for them. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, one thing that came to mind when you were speaking, Constanza, was that uh, you got federal systems in Germany and the U.S. And uh, a lot of what you're saying seems to explain maybe the difference in, in the effectiveness of the response, even though both countries have dispersed power, at least mm -hmm. to a degree, right? Well, let me put it this way. I think that two states that have very clearly struggled with, shall we say, implementing from the top of the executive downwards are the highly centralized uh, cases of France and the UK, who I think if you have a centralist system like that, it's then all about executable power. If you haven't devolved power downwards, you better have bureaucracies that can do this. And you better have politics that will let you do it. And I would say that I'm, I'm not sure that I'm able to speak to the state of the French or the British bureaucracies, but I would say that in both cases, the politics have become very polarized. You have a leadership both in the form of Boris Johnson and in the French President Macron, very much on the defensive, 
against populists in their own camp um, in, um, or, or outside of it. In France, it's, it's the hard left um, and the hard right that are um, sniping at the president. And in, in the UK, interestingly, it's suddenly a, you know, a new labor leadership that looks far more centrist, far more competent. Um, that is suddenly making the government look pretty poorly. Um, what's interesting is the comparative case, you, uh, Germany and the, and the US, two federalist um, states, and in fact, the German case, the German constitution post-war was very much modeled on the American example. But there's always been much more built-in tension in the American system, dating back to the days of the revolution and you know, throughout the 19th century and 20th century, the assumption was always, you know, conflict is good. We can handle this. Our political uh, culture is rambunctious, but in the end, we we come through. And and I think right now that American tradition is being tested somewhat. And it's um, it's also being tested, I think, because of the deep and growing underlying societal and economic inequalities. Um, that's not to say we don't have those in Germany, but they're not as extreme as uh, I, I think the you know the the spectrum isn't as lo as broad uh, by far as it is in this country. Is is the right and uh, you know the the surging right wing in Germany mm -hmm. uh, is is that undermining in any at any level what Merkel um, federal government? Actually, started? interestingly, the the AfD was doing very well until you know sort of fall last year, um, they were really putting the uh, grand coalition government of Angela Merkel on the defensive. Um, and in particularly in the eastern states, they were trying to pick off uh, Christian Democrat governments and trying to essentially force them into some sort of a de facto coalition. Um, that didn't work. And meanwhile, the AFD underwent a sort of self-radicalization process very publicly which caused the German domestic intelligence services to say, all right, enough of this. You know, this is so obviously, uh, you know, studded with neo-Nazis, identitarians and whatnot, that we're going to put this under domestic surveillance. Um, and right now, it's, it's notable that the IFD has done very badly in responding to the crisis. Um, they've um, really not come up with messaging that was in any way, um, you know, got them out of their poll doldrums. They're under, they're polling under 10%. And uh, although they were clearly trying to piggyback on some of the protests in German cities about the reopening, um, that's not take, I, I for, there, there were a couple of weeks where I thought this might go the same way. <coughs> I'm sorry, as the migration crisis in 2015, but right now it does not look like it. Now, we're at the beginning of this. I, I, I'm expecting more waves of this pandemic worldwide before a vaccine is found. We're looking at catastrophic economic events worldwide, including in Germany and Europe, uh, bazookas or no. So we're not, we're only at the, you know, the end of the beginning of the story and God knows what traction hard right or hard left movements will be able to gain before this is over and the vaccine is found. So um, a little bit of a different uh, tack here. Uh, Andrew is, you know, given all the challenges in Russia and challenges that Putin faces, uh, is Russia going to be a factor in our elections or in European politics, or is that overtaken by events now? I'd say that there's a couple things going on. One is obviously the U.S. is in a very deep uh, and, you know, hard to see, uh, easy to resolve set of crises that are interlocking with uh, the disorder, the effects of uh, the protests across the U.S. in major cities and small cities, for that matter, um, and the, the effects of the pandemic and the economic crisis. So all of that stuff is a, is a, is a very, very potent and disruptive set of forces that to me seem like uh, the, the elephant in the room. And what Russia is doing or isn't doing is probably going to be on the margins from that bigger, uh, very tragic set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. That said, we need to be, I think, a little more disciplined and a little more careful about how we talk about foreign interference in our democracy. There's a tendency to conflate, I would say, three spheres of activity. 
some of which we can deal with uh, as a society by improving our civic culture, by improving the knowledgeability about how people, you know, deal with social media, influencing their political uh, perceptions and hardening their biases. So disinformation as a category of, you know, the, pollute, the sort of information pollution that we're all confronted by from our phones and from our reliance on social media to get a handle on the world, that's not going away. I don't think it will go away during this campaign. In fact, a lot of the tactics and the techniques are being embraced by parts of the U.S. political spectrum right now. So it would be hard to disaggregate where the foreign evildoers are and where U.S. Uh, opportunistic use of the same kinds of divisive tactics uh, resides. The second category of stuff, which I think is a real potential problem, is the use of uh, computer intrusions and penetration of computer networks to sort of break into people's email to, as we saw in the 2016 campaign, to then release wholesale enormous archives of information to the, uh, the press and to, into the public domain, and then basically turn the dirty work over to reporters and others who are looking for the juicy bits. And that has happened not only in the United States, it's happened in a number of countries. And there are a lot of Russian fingerprints, including in Germany, on those kinds of activities, what would you call hack and release. And there are potential strategies, and one hopes that U.S. Uh, presidential campaigns will embrace those strategies to reduce their vulnerability going forward. And then the last category of stuff, which I think also there are there is scope for potential serious problems is actual effects on the tabulation and the vote system on election day. And could a foreign actor somehow do things across our very disparate electoral system in all 50 states to either impede people's ability to vote, to throw the system off, or to throw questions about the result? And if we have a close election campaign, and you know several of the most recent elections have been unfortunately very hotly contested. Um, the outcomes have been sort of questioned with, you know, different uh, winners and different losers coming away feeling quite, you know, embittered and also raising doubts about whether the election was free and fair. Um, you could see a really damaging scenario unfolding in the United States where things get really messy and there's going to be both domestic players who want to take advantage of that and there are going to be foreign players who seek to undermine our effectiveness as a society and as a player on the international scene. So it's it's a very it's a very worrisome situation. Um, it calls out for national level leadership um, and a bipartisan response. Uh, Chris, I, how, how do you look at uh, Russia and European politics? Is uh, it, uh, I mean, right now, it's I think there are several notable points to be made here, um, and I I, I think um, you know all of Andy's points are very well taken. These are very important distinctions. Um, Firstly, it's notable that the European sanctions consensus uh, or the consensus over the sanctions imposed as a result of the annexation of Crimea and, the, and Russia's fomenting of war in eastern Ukraine has held together since 2014. That's a fairly remarkable achievement. And it's the German leadership, for better or for worse, that has been holding it together um, despite um, problematic projects like the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which I personally wish I would, uh, would just whimper and go away, which it may well do, because I think it's economically pointless anyway. Um, but the, the, the reality is that Russian, Russia as a threat or as a genuine factor in European politics is being dwarfed currently by China, by an increasingly assertive, aggressive Chinese diplomacy that goes well beyond uh, covert or overt attempts to acquire physical and digital infrastructure um, and is very much now about political and even cultural dominance. Uh, however, to the, I mean, to the extent that it's also generating a very real pushback. Uh, the German uh, national telecoms provider um, today said that it was going to work with Ericsson rather than Huawei. Um, and the, a couple days ago, uh, just to make a final, to, uh, to dot the I's and cross the T's on the, on the Russia topic, um, famously, the German federal legislature, the Bundestag, saw a Russian 
uh, originated hack uh, about five years ago. And Merkel a couple of days ago said, you know, it's very clear that this was the GRU, the Russian military intelligence. And not only do we plan to institute criminal proceedings, we're also going to call for sanctions over this, which is fairly remarkable. Um, so I would say relationships, you know, the Russians are not profiting from what is going on here and from what has also been a, uh, a transatlantic relationship that has not been going well as evinced by the recent uh, kerfuffle over the G7, Angela Merkel saying she didn't want to come to America in uh, the early summer uh, because of uh, the travel risk. And the president's then saying, well, you know, I think that this, the G7 mode is outdated anyway, and I want to invite Russia, Australia, India, and what was the South Korea, I think was, was yeah. the other country. So that would make it G, G11. And I think at this point, all the traditional G7 countries have firmly put their foot down on re-inviting Russia, which was thrown out of the G8 because of the annexation of Crimea. So, you know, you would think that the Russians or the Chinese would get traction out of this kind of stuff, but clearly they're not. But but you are saying that China is kind of overshadowing Russia. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, and, and simply and, and, because yeah. their their resources, they because they have been so much more strategic, subtle, and resourceful, because they've put far more intellectual and diplomatic investment into this, whereas the Russian strategy has been destructive and opportunistic. Um, and I think beyond, you know, the occasional funding of European right wing parties or right wing political in individuals and messing uh, with the social media space through outlets, state funded and owned outlets like our Russia Today or Sputnik has really not gained them a great deal of traction. I mean, they've bought politicians, including a former German chancellor, but, but that's, you know. Is China also really in the US and Europe? Or, or I'm sorry. Is, Ch is China making progress toward overshadowing the U.S. in Europe? Well, yes and no. I think to the degree that the U.S. is losing influence in Europe, um, that's I have to say, to, sadly, because I'm a committed transatlanticist, to a great degree self-inflicted by this particular administration. Um, and yet, at the same time, you see. Uh, European governments and citizens in surveys trying to make a very careful distinction between uh, the, the current um, incumbent in the Oval Office and America as a country, as an ally, as a partner of Europe and its citizens. On the other hand, um, we're in no position to cut off transatlantic ties. We need America. I mean, everybody, you know, who, who knows, you know, who knows the facts knows that. But it is deeply unpleasant um, to be engaged in debates with a, an administration that cancels arms control treaties without discussing with the Europeans, such as more recently the Open Skies Treaty, um, that, you know, is clearly trying, trying to bring Russia back into the fold diplomatically. Um, that's really hard. So this is a, this is a very, very rocky relationship. And I would say that the Europeans have tried, you know, every way till Friday, in many ways, to to stay as far as possible on the good side of America and of this administration as they can, but it's not being made easy for them. Does that fuel traditional anti-Americanism, cultural anti-Americanism, which is always a reflection of our own self-doubt culturally? Yes. But you know what? I, that's that's always been there. That's kind of a cultural perennial, sadly. So um, we're running out of time. I, I uh, And I wanted to see whether Andrew or perhaps you, Constanza, wanted to wrap up. And I, I don't mean this to be facetious, but is there something hopeful we could talk about at the end as we wrap up this conversation, Andrew? Uh, what are you looking forward to that, that might not be as grim as some of the things that we talked about? Oh, man, you're asking a think tank person the worst question. Um, we hate this question. No, I'm just kidding. So the, um, uh, I think there is inescapably, and I hope that this can be a bipartisan issue, a need to reckon with the resurgent Russia. And there's a way to do that that's smart, that plays to our advantages, that stops being purely reactive, and that also recognizes 
both that we have a stake in a couple of areas like arms control, dealing with our huge nuclear arsenals, um, where there's some form of cooperation with Russia that's out of cold-blooded self-interest required. But at the same time, we do have to look ourselves in the mirror and not necessarily look to others and say, they're the source of our divisiveness and our poisonous political uh, acrimonious environment at the moment. So my hopeful moment, you know, against the backdrop of all the horrible things that are going on is that America needs to really do some serious self-evaluation. It needs to look at all the heartbreak and horrible things that are unfolding, and it needs to basically get to work and start addressing those. So, so that's very much, I think, what animates my work at the moment and, and my hopefulness about the future. That's I'll give you uh... very, very well taken. Um, in the same spirit, I you know I was saying earlier that that European political economies also very clearly had pre-existing conditions and vulnerabilities. That very much includes my own country, Germany. Um, we had skated along on on recent economic success and not wanted to look too closely at areas where we had not invested and that where we were vulnerable. So I think to the extent that we're being held up, you know, um, a mirror, that's good for us. And frankly, I will say as someone who has, you know, is the, the child of war children, remembers, you know, economic stagnation uh, in Europe, but also the, the just the sheer unbelieving joy of the 1989 moment, the fall of the wall and European reunification. I would say this is a moment where skating along is no longer going to work. Ignoring our own deficiencies, our own vulnerabilities is no longer go going to work. It's a moment to stand up and be counted. And it's a moment not just for you know, repairs and quick fixes, but for reviewing the architecture of our countries and of our alliances. And you know what, I'm up for that. I think that's a good thing. That. Um, is uh, I, I think I think we have the energy, the values, and the spirit to do that, and the goodwill. And I'm going to believe we can we can come through this better on the other side. Well, thank you both so much. You're both uh, great friends of the library. In fact, Andrew's going to be an incoming scholar at the library, and Constanza just finished an appointment at the library and, and remains a friend. Um, we're proud to have Thanks you both as friends of the library, and we look forward to having you on future programs and interacting in different ways. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Thanks, You're very Scott. welcome. It was a pleasure.